afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the launch of a screen in the shadow. Sorry, the sh a screen in the shadows by Mr. McDonald Dixon. I invite you to stand for the national anthem. Nicolette Bouisi, Mrs. Solange Charles Belisser, acting EPS, Ministry of Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture and Information, Mr. Ember Charles, Chairman of the Cohesive Center, Mr. Mel Shaw Henry, acting Executive Director, Cohesive Center, Mrs. Ramona Wynn, Executive Director of the Cultural Development Foundation, Dr. Jani Joseph, Representative of the South Louis Community College, invited guests, performers, well-wishers, on behalf of the Monsignor Patrick Folk Academy and the Cultural Development Foundation, I invite you to the launch of Mr. Dixon's latest creative project, A Scream in the Shadows. To begin our launch, we will start off with a musical rendition, and I invite Ms. Barbara Cadet to join me on stage. Thank you. 
I also want to take this opportunity, you know sometimes when you're on the side you get to see the audience. A special thank you of course to um, Mrs. Dixon for being here as well as to Sigrid Namel. Um, I see Jean and Kendall Hippolyte as well as um, June Frederick, um, also Delia Francois. Quite a number of persons from the artistic community and it is a pleasure to have you here today. Um, and have you as part of these proceedings. If I didn't mention any other names, um, I will get to you eventually. I'm very sorry if I didn't mention your name. At this point in time, we are going to have a reading of an excerpt of uh, the novel. Now, I haven't read the novel as yet. I intend to buy my copy today, but from what I know of Mr. Dixon's work, and what I have read uh, in terms of the reviews, Mr. Goddard wrote a wonderful review. I know that the work is one that is not just exciting, but very reflective of St. Lucia and our society. And so we will have this excerpt being read by um, Stacy Giddens, George Goddard, David McLennan, Sarah McLendon, and uh, Christopher Duncan. I was 10 going on 11 when it happened. I remember brushing my teeth by the standpipe outside our house. It was early. I was cleaning myself for school, trying to remove bedding smells from my body and dreading the cold water that was about to fall on my skin. I hear my mother shout, Andrew, hurry up and bathe. Don't forget you got school today. When she called me Andrew, I know things serious. Most times it's Andy when she wants me to take this for her or find that. Yes, Mama, I shout back, straining my voice. It was not clear if she heard me or not. She did the same thing every morning from Monday to Friday once I reach under the standpipe and open the tap. That day, out of the clear blue sky, a thunder come rolling in from the sea. I look out to the east over the water and catch sight of a patch of black cloud. On the hill where we live, we had a clear view of the horizon in any season. I could hear mama talking to my little brother Marvin, but her voice break in the strong wind that always come just before the rain. Mama dispatched Laurette, my big sister. She was two years older to her seamstress, Miss Claire, who lived on the high road. She still lives there near our school to lengthen her school skirt. Laurette was growing fast, Mama say, big for 13, and started wearing bra after she rushed past 12. Papa always get mad when fellas by the roll whistle at her, especially in her school clothes. He had put two men in court for indecent assault, but I didn't know what that mean un until I asked Mama, and she confused me with her answer. The boy touched Laurette where they not supposed to touch her. I was none the wiser. Laurette's uniform was riding up above her knee, and she tell mama that the boys in her class were always looking under her skirt. She bathed early long before me and take her tea. When I went out in the yard, she was putting on her clothes. I see papa in the kitchen when I just wake up, and he was still there 
when mama order me outside to bathe. Laurette passed close by me while I naked under the standpipe. She threw a little stone in joke. It knocked my backside. Not hard, but I pretend to bawl. I feel her hand on my shoulder as she peep over and say softly, you're getting big boy. I bar myself with both hands and in the corner of my eye, watch her skip off down the little dirt road and disappear past Miss Philomene's house under the bush. Mama sent me by the seamstress later to ask if Laurette was still there. I couldn't see any good reason why I was so close to my school, but that I must go back home just to tell Mama I didn't see Laurette. But if that is what Mama wants, there is nothing I can do about it. I know Laurette sometimes stop and talk with Fafan when they meet in the gap. He was living at his grandmother, Miss Philomene, just below us. I didn't see anything in that, but I suspect Mama was suspicious, and that's why she wanted me to report back. In fact, Miss Claire said that Laurette leave a long time ago. If I was drinking coffee, it would get so cold, I would have to throw it away. I reach to school just as it starts, in time for prayers. Let's say, a little after nine o'clock. Looking back over the years, I know I did not see Papa when he went back to our house. The last time I saw him, I am sure of this, no matter what Mama say, was after Laurie hit me on my backside with the pebbles. He leave home in a hurry, down the gap towards the high road. He was always in a rush. I recall him wearing khaki short pants, but no shirt. To me, he had a white plastic bottle in his hand, but I'm not sure. I don't know if it's my imagination playing tricks. I did not see him return. I would have been at school, but mama claimed he was in the kitchen when I left the house, and even now she sticks to this. She was certain I saw papa eating a piece of bread and taking his tea while she watched me bathe. From the angle of the bath, it's not possible to see inside the kitchen. If I had seen him, I would remember saying goodbye to him when I leave for school. But Mama said, but Mama does not want to hear that. In her mind, Papa was in the kitchen and never leave the house all morning until he go and help Miss Granny cut a tree on her land above our house. Nobody can blame him for what happened outside. And I was her witness. For the, for the morning, six months after Lorette's funeral, cocks were crowing loud in the yard. I turned a little on my side to ease out of the dream to hear like somebody knocking hard on the door. I was tempted to get up and check, but something tell me to go back to sleep. Next, I wake up for good to a loud banging men shouting, open, police. Mama get up shaking Papa. He was asleep in the bed. Wake up, Lovin. Police. Papa yawned, but quickly catch himself and put on his pants. I followed them to the door. Marvin was still asleep. Four officers in plain clothes rushed inside as soon as Papa turned the key in the lock. One of them had a sheet of paper in his hand. Are you Lovin, said Mark. What? Papa looked stunned. He couldn't say much. What happened to Love and St. Mark? Yes, it's his house. Mama was ready to take on all four officers. This is your husband? The officer with the paper asked. Yes, it's Love and Love and St. Mark, I have a warrant for your arrest for the murder of Lawrence Stevens. From now on, you, anything you say, can be taken down and held in evidence against you. An officer took out a pair of handcuffs and secured Lovin. Said Mark, hands behind his back. Mama went home. I followed Papa when the police marched him outside. There were six in all. Two armed with rifles stayed outside. Mama tried to hold me back in the doorway, but I slipped through her hands. Although still very early, crowds a crowd gathered by the roadside. Children were there with their parents. And later in school, they were happy to tell me how the policeman handled Papa and shoved him in the back of the jeep. It was not a good day for me at school. 
I hung my head in shame over my desk, listening to the children speak about my father. They didn't care if I got vexed. They were with one voice. The police walk him to the house, push him in the back of the seat, and carry him down to the station. Boa! They rejoiced. The news went wild, swinging on vines around Boa Nef, uphill to Techime, and deep into Guambua. Papa was arrested and condemned without a hearing or a trial, and his whole family crucified in the process. In this little place behind God's back, justice is one face you seldom see. And if you're poor, you might never see it. Sometimes, time sits on your case, and after several years, will allow you a hearing. By then, you would be lucky if witnesses remember your face. For my father, it would be many years before his day came. To say I remember Papa ever speaking to me the morning police came for him, either in sympathy, pity, or regret, would be a lie. He kept his face in front and didn't look back. One of our cousins, Miss Eldora's eldest daughter from Techime, came by the school to collect me that afternoon and to take me to her house. She was on her own living with her boyfriend. I stayed with her because Mama went with Marvin to Denry Police Station where they charged Papa without bail. Nobody could explain to me and I did not understand what was going on. My father's case was called every year, at least once, sometimes twice. But on account of some technicality, it was always adjourned. So back he went to Her Majesty's prison in Castries, to an overcrowded jail filled of inmates awaiting trial, mostly young men, underprivileged with no jobs. Papa's lawyers were having a ball drawing fees from government without having to work. For 11 years, Mama went up and down the road hoping for a trial. But there was only adjournment after adjournment, world without end, but no amen. Detectives who started as juniors on the case got promoted. Some left the force. The chief of police job changed hands umpteen times. Lawyers came and lawyers went. Every time they take my father to court, they started afresh, like it was a new case. Everybody was green, except the accused. One day, when I couldn't take it again, feeling sorry for mama, I asked Sergeant Willis, boldface, what you think going to happen with Papa's matter. What you mean? He grinned, taken by surprise. You think he's guilty? I pressed him. I'm not a judge. I'm not a jury. Things look too neat, I stammered. It's so easy to plant evidence. Oh, that's good. An open mind. Keep an open mind was all he said. However, after remaining silent for a while, he swallowed his spit and spoke. I was a little policeman when the commotion starts. I know your mother long. You grew up, we grew up together. She was damn good looking when she was young. If we were not family, I could have married her. I find myself on the case when I get to know her husband was involved. My spirit never take to him. But like I tell you, always approach the case with an open mind. Questions came racing through my head. Suddenly, I wanted to know more than there was to know about and beyond this case. The files are there. You, you can go through them when you want, Sarge said. You've got a lot of reading to catch up. You will help me, I teased. Once Sarge is in my corner, I will reach where I want to go. I, too, have a lot of questions. One thing, though, 
Don't involve the others. Keep whatever you find between us. You don't have to tell me, Sarge. After many, many visits, and Mama get back accustomed to me around the house again, there was a day her tongue slipped. She was in the kitchen in a talkative mood. I was sitting by the table, watching her scale some pot fish I bring. We cover several subjects, including how grateful she was for the little help I was giving her about Marvin and his friends her neighbors. We speak about almost everything except Papa or Lorette. Then she started humming one of her favorite church hymns. We stand for God and for his glory without lifting her head from the basin and the fish. I wait until she ran out of high notes. Why you, what you find in that hymn? You humming it nonstop since I was a little boy. I ask, pretending to joke. She did not look at me, but answered with a question. Why you keep troubling me with all those things, eh? I just find myself humming it too when I'm in trouble. I look at her as she pick up a small fish and plunge her kitchen, her kitchen knife into the guts. A little blood splatter on her cheeks and she wipe it away with her elbow in a rage. Why you don't go and ask Rupert and Curtis? Your father report them for rape, for rape Lorette. You forget? Those two names again. Miss Claire mentioned them to me. In Mama's head, trying was doing. Rape Mama? I never heard it try to rape Lorette. I thought it was indecent assault. If it was rape, that's serious. All like now, they should be in jail. I take time off to learn more about Rupert and Curtis. The names were on police files, but not for rape or attempted rape. You don't live here. How do you expect to know what's happening up here? Mama was leading to something. Perhaps she was unburdening her mind. I can't know if you don't tell me. What I understand is they tried to touch Lorette's breast one afternoon after school. I never hear about this rape business. If they try to touch her, what is that? She not their friend. She don't know them. What they want to touch her for? Mama, indecent assault is not rape. I understand attempt, depending on how far they go, but they never tried to rip her clothes off, which means they never touched her. Papa was the one who made a big fuss, but he had no case. I know, Mr. Lee, I saw you. you know you were into it and you're wondering why it stopped right now. You as well, I saw you. You seem very into the reading. Thank you so much for being here. They will be back a little later. But at this point in time, we just want to take a moment because you know Mr. Dixon is a man of many talents. And we want to share with you some of his other accomplishments, some Mr. Dixon in um, a different artistic arena. So for this, I ask you to have a look at the screen and um, enjoy. I 
I sent you in Martinique, Maitre, the unfolding letter of a sail, a letter beyond the lines of blindingly white breakers, of lace-laden surplices and congregational shales. I did not send any letter, though it flailed on the wind. Your island is always in the haze of my mind, with the blown-about seabirds in their creole clatter of vowels, metra among makers, whom the reef recites when the copper sea almonds blaze, beacons to distant Dakar and the dolphins' acres.
know by now, some persons are saying, I would love to know some more about Mr. Dixon. We do have that covered. We invite you to watch this video that gives you just an idea of the other accomplishments of this great man. McDonald Ernest Dixon was born in Castries, St. Lucia in 1944. He attended the Canon Laurie Anglican Primary School and St. Mary's College. And from quite early on, he manifested the multifacetedness which continues to mark his work as an artist. As a student, while he was filling his exercise books with adolescent poetry, he was also covering pages of his drawing books with sketches. After graduating from the St. Mary's College, he joined the Royal Bank of Canada and later the National Commercial Bank of St. Lucia, where he went on over a 30-year period to forge a successful career in banking. During that period, he rose steadily to the highest banking position at the Royal Bank of Canada, becoming its first local manager. And when the National Commercial Bank of St. Lucia was established, he was at the helm there as its first managing director in 1981. Dixon also went on to serve in the capacity of trade and commerce advisor to the government of St. Lucia. Macdonald Dixon is an established and well-known poet, novelist, short story writer, actor, photographer, and painter who is also actively involved in the world of theater as a playwright, actor, and director. He became interested in the arts at an early age and was just 16 years old when he came across Derek Walcott's 25 poems while exploring the shelves of his school library at the St. Mary's College. In the mid-1960s, Dixon was swept up in the maelstrom of activity by the St. Lucia Arts Guild, which was started by Derek Walcott and his brother Roderick, becoming involved in performing and directing. He acted in a range of plays from European classics like Oedipus Rex and Julius Caesar to Caribbean comedies such as One for the Road. In directing also, he ran the gamut. The modernistic The Queen and the Rebels sits comfortably in his directing portfolio alongside The Mock Doctor, a Caribbean adaptation of Moliere's The Doctor in Spite of Himself. You saw what I did? You saw what I had to do? You hid him all these years. I suppose they would call you a good nigger. You saw what I have had to do. Dixon's first publication was a collection of poems entitled Pebbles, 1973. He then set his hand to writing plays and his work began to appear in several magazines and anthologies throughout the region. When the Arts Guild ended, he continued to write plays, drawing heavily on his knowledge of folk heritage and local history. His play, the folk musical Tindy, directed by George Fish Alfos and featuring music by Charles Cadet, was St. Lucia's theatrical presentation at Carifesta 5 in 1992 in Trinidad. In his writings, Dixon seeks to recreate the history of his people's myths and legends to serve as a reference for contemporary and future writers in his country. An accomplished photographer, Dixon's love of country is continuously transcended through his photography of St. Lucia's landscape and rich cultural heritage. Dixon's biography of works includes, and are not limited to, novels and short stories, Saints of Little Paradise, Book One, Eden Defiled, 2012, Misbegotten, 2009, Kawem, 2009, Season of Mist, 2007. Poetry, Collected Poems, 2003, The Poet Speaks and Other Poems, 1993, Pebbles, 1973. Plays, The Glass Doll, A Soldier Always, The Chosen, Diablote, Tindy, Calendar, The Last Lamp. Dixon continues to guide and bridge the gap to the new generation of writers, directors, and artists. He helped develop and stage One for the Road with Kingsley Powlett, 1972, 
co-directed Melania Daniels' Jesus of Conway with Drinia Frederick in 2003. His exploratory theatrical work and readings with St. Mary's College students, St. Lucia's Writers' Forum, and 2019 guidance on Jesse Myers and Monique Ogis, A Little Folktale, St. Lucia's theatrical contribution for Carifesta 14, are all part of the mentoring that has marked his continuing artistic journey. Dixon has steadfastly served his country over the years in many important positions, including that of Acting Governor General of St. Lucia when required. Though Dixon's character and personality continue to reflect that of a modest man focused on work and not accolades, the societal recognition of his work and contribution to the arts is manifested in him being awarded the St. Lucia National Medal of Merit 1993 for his long-standing contribution to literature and photography and the Cultural Development Foundation's 2005 Lifetime Achievement Award for his invaluable contribution to the arts in St. Lucia. Dixon, I have to say, quite an impressive um, list of accomplishments. Sorry? You've been living long, yes, and full, quite a full life. Now, at this point in time, I know, again, as we said earlier on, you wanted more of the book. So, Ms. Victor, Mr. Montroop, we are ready for our second reading, yes? So now I'd like to call on the actors for the second reading, we have Miss Stacy Giddens, we have Miss Jesse Myers, Kendall Hippolyte, David McLennan, Sarah McLennan, and uh, Mr. Goddard. You look like Mr. Goddard in the, in the dark there, that's what. That is Mr. Christopher Duncan. to go outside to pass water in my mouth. I forgot my toothbrush ba back in Castries and borrowed hers. Mama was already in the kitchen. I stand in the open, my back to the house, like when I was small, and peel down the little hill before I pass the wash rag with some soap on my face. You're not forgetting your, ma your bad manners, eh, Andy? I hear Mama's voice. It come from inside the kitchen. She was in good spirits. After I scrubbed my teeth, I went to the kitchen, sit in the old chair that's been around from before I was born. Mama hand me a cup of coffee, hot like she know I like it, black and very sweet. I see Angel almost ready, Mama said, trying to make small talk. She still has some months to go. I blushed. You all have a name for the baby yet? If it's a girl, we will call her Lorette. We don't think it will be a boy. If it's a boy, call him Lovens. I couldn't believe she was serious. We'll see about that when the time comes. I forced myself to smile, but a smile just couldn't come to my face. Mama was ready to jump all over me to defend her husband. Lovens didn't do nothing wrong. You of all people know that. Something in her voice told me she was not herself. You think he would touch a child he'd bring up and feed from a baby? Why is he still in jail then, Mama? I was uncertain how this would sound in her ears. I don't know. She started to cry, hiding her face as usual in a dark corner. Mama, how many times I will say it? I'm not little again. There's no need to hide things from me. I'm not hiding things from you. She could have blown my head off with a gun if she had one and would be none the wiser in my coffin. That's how angry she got all of a sudden. I hear things every day that make me afraid. I don't go by the road again unless I have to go. 
Mama, stop listening to people. They will send you mad. Which people? Sometimes I just can't take it. It's too much. Tell me what you hear, Mama. What making you feel afraid? Tell me. I watch tears roll down her cheeks faster than the little ravine we call river below the house. Mama wipe her eyes with her skirt and stare at me. Her lips move, spitting out words. Your father is not Lorette father. It had been like a cancer inside her. It took a lot to spit it out. I know, I said. Angel was a real angel by name and nature. I always say I was the luckiest man in the world the day I lose my way in the ministry building and ask her for directions on the elevator. She looked at me sideways as if afraid, saying in her mind, what that man looking like looking at me so for? You don't have to be scared, I tell her. I'm a police officer, although I was still a recruit at training school. She looked at me without smiling. That's when I should be afraid. What happened? You lose your smile, I asked, putting on my best sexy tone. The elevator reached third floor. This is where you go in, she said as the door opened. What about you? One up. When I finish, can I come to see you? The door closed without getting a reply. No chance to putting a comma edgewise. Something strange was happening to me. I could not control myself from wanting to see her again. Attractive, a little plain face, no lipstick, no earrings. She looked new to the job like me, fresh from school. I wondered if she had a boyfriend or was having a crush on somebody. Two weeks after our first encounter, on my way to the ATM to get some weekend money, who should I see going in the same direction? Hello, I shout, jockeying to get abreast. She did not answer. I skip forward faster and catch up with her. Not you again, she glared. You tracking me or what? Oh no, I will never do that. You men, I don't know what to believe when you speak. You sound defensive. I brave the choppy waters. I'm not afraid of you. She looked at me under her eyelids like somebody wearing glasses. Her eyes were brown. What's your name, she asked. Too stunned to speak. I paused before opening my mouth. Andrew. Friends call me Andy. I don't know why I'm talking to you. My mother warned me about policemen. I'm not a full policeman yet. I hear you. She nipped and increased her speed. I'd like very much to be your friend, I stutter, afraid of what she might reply. I don't have boyfriends. That means I'll be the first? Maybe, if you have guts to face my mother. Thank God she keeps all of you away. I'm sure your mother is a nice person. A little voice tell me I'm doing much better than I believe, but don't get overconfident. If I must ask your mother to be your friend, I will. You want me to ask her? You are strange. She shrugged her shoulders and smiled at me. Why you say so? You don't ask me my name, you don't ask me for my phone number, and you want to meet my mother? We laughed. I am Angel. I'm a receptionist on the fourth floor. She pointed at the building behind us where we met on the elevator. About two to three weeks after Papa come from jail, Angel gave birth to a baby girl. She weighed seven pounds, eight ounces. Angel come from hospital with a baby three days after confinement and went straight by her mother. She had me until she learned how to feed and bathe the baby properly. According to Miss Beatrice, Angel didn't know anything about man or child. She herself didn't give her no bope and never looked for more children after Angel was born. Miss Beatrice was superstitious. Every Monday morning, she took a trip to the Gade to learn about her future and come back repeating some of the strangest things you could ever hear. The one miracle in her life the Gade never foresee to warn her was Angel having a baby girl. There was prediction from Angel's first child was going to be a boy and Miss Beatrice dutifully drowned herself, drowned herself in blue. 
I remain alone for a month in our little two-room house and visit Angel and our baby after work. At night, my mind wander. There was always the moment when my thoughts go back to the day Papa find Lorette under the bush. I start seeing Lorette every night, alive and fresh in my mind, but looking very restless. I speak to a young priest after mass one morning, and he tell me, maybe she's unhappy. He recommend I give her mass for the repose of her soul. I give him $10, I don't know if he said the mask, because Lorette keep appearing more often than before. Just like she was in the coffin. Her face make up like a big woman with rouge on her cheeks and lipstick on her lips, and not a day older. One night, I was lying on the bed watching television, tired, listless, sleep not come in. On top of that, the electric company them take the current and they leave me in the dark. It's difficult for me to believe some of what happened is just coincidence. Dreams are so alive, they put reality to shame. Imagine, I, I by myself, pitch black, can't see my hands, yet I hear a fine, clear voice calling my name. Andrew? 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 I could hear the breeze on the roof and a dog howling in the neighbor's yard. I put my head back down on the pillow. I can hear vehicles racing up and down the street. Then I hear the fine clear voice again. He, he killed me and nothing for that. I jump out of bed and bolt to the door. Papa showed no remorse. I don't know if he tell her sorry in the bedroom. Stranger things does happen there. I don't need evidence to show his lack of sympathy. He did not disguise it. I cannot choose my father. That's my mother's job. But I can disown him. Once he gives me cause, the more I thought about it, the less reason I find for mama to continue to remain with papa. Not because you marry him and carry his children, you got to remain. It was my duty to remove Tifwe and Mama. But where to begin? What can I say to convince her to leave? I offered to go down by Paulina's to buy some groceries for the house. Mama insisted, no. Your father will bring food when he come. Papa did not come back until after dark. Drunk. Both hands swinging like police on parade. Papa marching to the kitchen like a big boss. Instead of starting with the usual good night, he went harassing Mama. A strong smell of white rum on his breath filled up the tiny space. He demanded his food and went and wanted warm right away. The house rule seems to me. Stop when you, what you are doing and attend to me. I wanted to ask mom about the groceries he was supposed to buy, but that would invite trouble. Shame can cause you to do things and say things you don't mean. And for sure, she would feel embarrassed. She dish out his food, yam and sardines in a large bowl and placed it on the kitchen table with a spoon. Get up, Andy, and let your brother sit down. Sorry, let your father sit down. That was Mama's way of ordering me out of the kitchen. She see on my face, I was not pleased. Your father must be tired. That was a lame excuse, but I got up without looking at him. Marvin, bring out the old mattress. He just sleep onto the front. I was tired. And before I put my head down, I fell asleep. I know nothing again until four o'clock start chanting in the tall trees behind the kitchen between the drizzles on the roof to tell me it's going to be morning soon. The next morning, I jump on the first minivan I meet going to Denry and I get off by the police station. 
Corporal Jean Pierre was off duty. I went to his house to remind him that no officer had come up to interview Mama, and I was getting worried the matter was low on the agenda. I know we have a reputation for treating matters involving domestic violence cool, like the, the private affairs between two people and not police business. I see a number of cases for assault, assault and battery, call with neither complainant nor the accused present on the day of the case. Perhaps this disgusts officers and in the end they don't want to waste precious time on matters that will die a natural death. Corporal Jappé tried to reassure me this was not the case with our matter. But, he said, your mother has not given a statement or make a complaint. My hands are tied. Don't worry, I will untie them. I will bring her down to the station when you are on duty. I was suspicious about Corporal Jean-Pierre. I hear rumors that he himself got a history of beating his girlfriends. He should have been made sergeant long ago, but he had blemishes on his file. None of the complaints he was involved in ever reached the stage to be investigated. The women withdrew before the suspect was questioned. The top brass keep him in exile in Denry, away from the bright lights. I get back to Buanef earlier than expected. My mama was in the kitchen, sitting in a corner, gazing into space, both hands under her chin. I placed the groceries on the kitchen table, still in plastic bags. I turned to find her eyes red. She was crying. Something happened. I hope it's not another beating. She shook her head when I asked her, Pointless quarreling, all I could do is order her to the bedroom, put on her clothes. We're going to the station. This nonsense has got to stop. I was gasping for breath, but more facts than I really should. What, what nonsense? I got her to open her mouth at last. I go to open the window and, and the wind swing it back and, and, and hit my face. Which window, Mama? She pointed to the kitchen window. A wind? The table is between you and the window. You either have to move the table aside or climb on it and stick your neck out. No window hit you in the face, Mama. No window give you a black eye. You're telling me I lie? Mama, don't forget my work. I solve cases worse than a black eye. I see them every day. One of these days, you will end up dead. Oh, you, 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 think, you, know, you, you think you know everything? Just, just because you're a policeman? She woke herself up to a frenzy using curse words I never hear coming from her mouth before. She, she's repeating what she learned from Papa since he came from prison. I soothed my nerves, trying to convince myself not to blame her. He put her through hell. I sit down at the kitchen table and remain quiet until she simmered down enough to listen. L let me see your eyes, Mama. And I hold her hand. She recoiled. Believe what you want. She shifted to her favorite corner, stooped down, and she clasped her hands between her thighs. Come straight, Mama. I know what happened. But you still have to say. I spoke gently. Oh, you, you, you come from where you come from. Listen to, to, to what people by the road say. And you decide to make my life miserable. They tell your love and beat me. And you believe them? Nobody has to tell me. That's why, that's why you, you, you're asking all these questions. I know where you're going, where you come from here. Some, some indiscreet don't, don't tell you Lovins punched me in my eye. Just like they, they make the police believe that it's, it's he that killed Lorit. One of these days, somebody will pay for the time. I just hope it's not you, Mama. I could not resist. The remark bounced off my tongue like, like a sponge cake. Lovitz never put his hand on me. From the day I know him, he loved me. He loved Lorette. He loved all his children. Tell those people that put things in your mind to leave me and my husband alone.
so we continue the story of Dixon about Dixon. And I would like to welcome Mr. Robert Lee. A few remarks about Dixon and to introduce the writer. Thank you, Ambert. And thank you to the readers of Magdi's work. When I read that novel, I thought that opening chapter was one of the best I've read for a long time, opening chapters. <clears throat> and I think Magdi captured the, the St. Lucian English vernacular so very well. And you heard it come out in the readings. The Impulat Rizik of the General Emerita. Um, DPS is with us, which is Solange Belizea. Charles Belizea, Ramona of CDF, EDF CDF is here. All the crew of FRC, <coughs> Masnia Papa Anthony, Embert Melcho and others. <coughs> now, seeing as I walked in, so many of us, we haven't seen each other for the past two, for most of the past, most of the last two years. <coughs> I certainly have been here for a long time myself, so it's a pleasure to be with all of you again. So, members of the Independence Committee, if somebody said Daryl is around, Montreux, <clears throat> welcome Daryl if you're here somewhere. Uh, members of the Independence Standing Committee, let me on your behalf, welcome those joining us on live stream, both here at home in St. Lucia, regionally and internationally. And Magdi, I'm sure you want me to welcome Polly Patulo, um, <clears throat> publisher who's probably viewing with us online. I have known MacDonald Dixon for most of my life. The earliest memories of him go back to primary school days at the Anglican School and his walking home with his mother up Trinity Church Road. <clears throat> One vivid memory I have recorded in a poem <clears throat> is of Magdi running down Church Road, his long hair flying, and my cousin commenting with laughter on his flight. My other school remembrances are from St. Mary's College, where Dixon, showing early signs of financial entrepreneurship and marketing skills, used to sell bread and butter at the back of SMC to schoolboys while he read from exercise books his war stories of diving spitfires. For the younger people, his spitfires were these war plays the English people used. I must confess I was one of his enthralled customers. <clears throat> In 1967, after completing St. Mary's College and going to work at the Royal Bank of Canada, I met Magdi for the first time since the other glimpses of him were from a distance. He quickly became a mentor and has remained a friend ever since. <clears throat> In those years, he already had a reputation as St. Lucia's best-known local home-based poet, Derek Walgett, then already a long resident in Trinidad and Tobago. Magdi was a friend of Roderick Walcott, he was a member of the influential St. Lucia Arts Guild. He was already acting and directing as well as writing plays. Through him, I joined the Guild and was soon on stage for the first time, being directed by Mr. Dixon. My love for and involvement with theater were rooted in this introduction to drama. As a writer, Magdi also catalyzed my nascent interest in and gift for literature, its reading and writing. I guess he found me an admiring disciple, <clears throat> and we spent much time at the Voice Bookshop, which is then at the head of Bridge Street, the library, Arts Guild rehearsals, Clarkie's Bar, <laughs> which not many here would remember, Magdi, you know, I don't know if Pablo would know where that was, Marian Street, <clears throat> the Bang Bachelor's Quarters, and other related activities of young men of our time. In our circle in those years, the late 60s, <clears throat> there were Roddy Walcott and his wife Stella, who worked with us at the bank. I remember spending about two weeks with Roddy and Stella and Magdi and others on Rat Island. Askel actors like the late Arthur Jacobs. Patricia Ismond, who later became an internationally recognized Walcott scholar. Pat Charles, Stanley Reed of Barbadian living here at the time. Very good friend of Magdi's, but that's another story. <laughs> Stanley Reed. <clears throat> Stanley Reed with Augustus Justin, whose picture you saw earlier on. <clears throat> Myself, Magdi and 
and Augustine Magdi. Augustus just my sister standing at the launch of Magdi's book at the library. Stanley Reed with Augustus Justin and Kenny Anthony, yes, the Kenny Anthony, started a literary magazine titled Link, in which most of us published our first poems and stories. I went off to Cave Hill, UV, in 1969, and alongside literature and other studies, continued my involvement in theatre as acting director, and began to write even more seriously poems, stories, reviews. In 1963, <clears throat> Magdi paid me a huge compliment by asking me to write the foreword to his first poetry collection, Pebbles, which had been edited by another criminal of those days. <laughs> edited by Papa Anthony, another enduring friendship from those days who is still with us. In my foreword, I wrote, I'm convinced that since Walker Derrick, you are the only St. Lucian poet writing truly about St. Lucia, yet in not so parochial a way that nobody else knows what you're talking about. Kendall Hiplett, another long friend of ours, has frequently referenced the literary and arts traditions of St. Lucia. My early comment then in the foreword to Magdi's first book placed Dixon in that clear line of our literary tradition. After Derek Walker, at 18, had published 25 poems in 1948, which was printed in Trinidad and later on in Barbados, Derek went on to publish two other early works before his important In a Green Night in 1962 with the UK publisher Jonathan Kay brought him international attention. In the meantime at home, only Hunter Francois, first and last poems 1949, and Howick Elcock with his book Alpha 1950 had produced single poetry collections. When in 1973, Dixon, as the voice of a new generation of St. Lucian poets and dramatists, brought out Pebbles and then followed it with several other collections, he became the acknowledged successor to Walcott and the earlier home-based writers here in St. Lucia. Magdi's example and work opened the door to new writers who quickly appeared. Lee, Hippolyte, St. Clair, King, Auger, Martial, Mitchell and others. They brought out collections rapidly, influenced by Walcott and Dixon, who had shown that local writing and publishing were valid and important artistic activities. My bibliography, St. Lucian Writers and Writing and Author Index, which Papier Press published in 2019, provides a listing of our writers and their works across poetry, prose, and drama. So all these writers are mentioned. You can find them listed in their works in that um, index of St. Lucian Writers. Kendall Lippolit, <coughs> has spoken often of his admiration for Dickens, Dixon's industry. Not only is Magdi a prolific writer of poetry, but as you heard earlier, has authored several plays, novels, and short stories. <clears throat> the novels and short stories have been published, while many of the plays have been produced and await publication. I've been encouraging him to put out a collection of the plays. <clears throat> Even as we launch his latest novel, A Scream in the Shadows, published by the important Papier Press, based in London and Dominica. He's already working on another novel, <clears throat> keeps sharing new poems with friends, writes the occasional review, and plans are being made for filming one of his historical dramas, Kessner. Did I mention he has been a painter? I think at the end of the program, Pablo will be introducing an exhibition of Magdi's photographs, which are going up. <clears throat> Magdi has recently revived his photography, producing some fascinating surrealistic work using computer editing techniques. He is one of those multi-gifted Caribbean artists who works successfully in several genres. This veteran writer has made a parallel career in banking, is an expert in copyright and trade issues. You did hear he once was deputy to the governor general. <laughs> he never invited people like Kendall and myself to share the, the, the bear sellers of the government house, you know, your, your excellency, um, but that's another story. And he can be counted on in social gatherings to be a raconteur <coughs> of local politics, the arts and culture, and wherever the old talk leads. In published articles and interviews, I have always named Magdi as a mentor. It was an article I published very recently, and I named him again. Close friends probably know us aspiring partners, teasing each other constantly. I've often cited my gratitude that the creative artists of my generation, especially us writers, have kept respectful relationships <clears throat> without searing quarrels or destructive disputes. Even as we recognize each other's viewpoints, 
guard personal spaces, support each other without maudlin flattery. In the work we do out of our common ground, this simply see, that is home and inspiration to us. If we sit at the feet and sat at the feet of Derek Walcott and Roddy and Stanley French and Garth and Dunstan and so on, MACD has been one of our major cornerstones and reference points. And we, and I certainly speak for myself, I know I speak for all of us here, and friends listening. Magdi, we are grateful for your faithfulness and long dedicated contribution to the arts and culture of our island. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. God bless you. I think I need to make a small correction, Robert. Mark Diaz, Acting Governor General, when required to do so. Deputy too, when required. So he's still available. And perhaps, if he's required to do so, you may be invited to the government house. Is Deputy Emeritus? Not yet. <laughs> but thank you, Robert. Let me now invite Mark D to share a few words with us as the author of this new publication, Scream in the Shadows. Over to the author. Well, um, don't ask me how much I paid Robert, huh? please. <laughs> Might be embarrassing. <laughs> Dame Pollett, Permanent Secretary, um, Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry. And so long, I don't want to make a mistake and get it out of order. Sigrid, um, Mrs. Wynn, please let your hair. And I'm very grateful for the sponsorship of CDF and um, the Folk Research in making this evening possible. I'm sure that my publisher will join me in thanking you for this kind gesture. Um, I'm not famous for my speeches because I tend to misplace um, words and say certain things I ought not to say. So I will be very brief and just thank all of you who took time off to come out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to attend this. And I'll do what I can do best, read my own work. So here's a little excerpt from, I forget the name and all, A Scream in the Shadows. And um, I hope you like it. The air around me was thick against my skin, the place quiet. I could almost touch the silence. Sarge creep ahead to the edge of the kitchen and craned his neck into the yard. He turned in slow motion, then raised both hands. Stop! Don't come any further. You have your piece? What I need a gun for, I said to myself. My nine get knotted in vines. I believe I shout no. Why take a gun to come and talk to my father? Sarge hadn't taken his gun either. However, from where I was, I could see like something hit him hard across the face. I paralyzed too. My feet, my hands anchor me where I'm standing. I can't shift left, I can't move right. I see the turtle of his shirt jack head towards the kitchen steps, moving very slowly on tiptoe like he didn't want to mash the ground hard in case it disappeared under his foot. Somehow, I inch forward, ignoring his orders. I could see the open back door, the bedroom, but not the whole yard. My head started to spin. I didn't notice Miss Pinky shoot past and begin bawling down the place as if her mother finally decided to die. I tell you, to stay where you are, I hear Sarge's voice, but couldn't see him. Miss Pinky was in the middle of a fit, screaming and pulling out the little hair left on her head. Messing up a crime scene, woman. Sarge was speaking to Miss Pinky. I could now see Miss Pinky holding Mama by the shoulders and shaking her hard. Mama was sitting on the kitchen steps, holding a body across her lap. From the feet, shoes, and pants, it was a man. But things take 
a while to register, as if I'm in the cinema watching in slow motion. I could see blood, lots of blood. I go from feeling giddy to feeling numb. Sarge tried to stop me. I was too strong for him. I pulled Miss Pinky away from Mama, and she grabbed me by the neck. I was taller than her and could see over her shoulder. Mama's eyes were wide open, gazing past us, staring like a statue into space, face blank, eyes dry. She was not crying, not even vexed. I self was too dazed to absorb what I was seeing, too numb to react. I remember sitting down by Miss Pinky and looking across at Mama in the kitchen steps. What happened, Mama? What happened? Is all I remember seeing and looking at all the blood splattered everywhere, just shaking my head over and over and over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you, MacDonald. The evening has just started, actually. I think now we have some remarks from the publisher, Pauli Patsulo. Um, can I get a cue when it's on, please? We want to invite Polly, who has assisted many solution writers to take the work overseas. to contribute to this really great program to celebrate the publication. So good to see copies of the printed word in everyone's hand. Um, thanks to um, the really lovely introduction by Robert Leaves. Indeed, always done so much to support Abbey Press. You've all done the book proud, um, and also I was most interested to learn more about Matt's rich, creative life. I really, I really just, just want, want to say, say what a great, great pleasure it has been for me to publish this remarkable book. And, and so, so to add to the distinguished literature of St. Lucia and the wider Caribbean. Um, I Looking back in the last few days, I checked the email correspondence that I'd had with Mac about the book, and I noticed that it started a long time ago, as in October 2018, um, when Mac wrote to me to say that he had this manuscript and would I be interested in publishing it. Well, it's been um, a long time. I think it was three years later when it actually went to the publisher, and he had to deal with endless suggestions from me and demands and queries. And I'm very grateful that he actually never complained, at least not to me. Um, when he responded to endless lists of um, what things I would like, to, I wanted him to do, he would reply, mm, in, the say, in, in this sort of way, he said, he would say, I'm not afraid of tackling this, or I must be a masochist for enduring this pain and liking every minute of it. So it, it really was a, a tremendous um, process and, and enriching process and learning process for me as well. So now it's published, it's a great moment. I think this book is remarkable. From the moment I read that first page, I love the tone and the language, and I absolutely echo what Robert Lee said about that. It's a traditional whodunit, 
but it also explores very um, powerful and important um, themes of Caribbean life in a disturbing way. It's certainly um, a death far from paradise rather than in paradise. So please do buy it, read it, enjoy. Massive congratulations to Mac. I'm, again, I wish I was here with you and thank him for writing such a wonderful book. I send you all good wishes and I so, and also just congratulations to all in St. Lucia on your 43rd independent celebrations. So thank you very much and do continue to enjoy your afternoon. Thank you. Another round of applause, please, for Paul. At this point in our program, we invite the author, MacDonald Dixon, to make a presentation of a few copies of the book. You'll get them, they are autographed. And I will make a special appeal for those of you who are here to purchase your copy. It doesn't cost much. I've purchased mine, I've read it, and I've enabled the sale of many copies for Dixon. In fact, he called me, he called me his traveling salesman. <laughs> Robert will talk about commission. That's for FRC. So first person we would like to call on is Your Excellency Dim. Prolet Louise, Governor General Emerita, to receive a copy. They'll be autographed, I guess, afterwards. On behalf of the, well, before the Folk Research Center, Monsieur Patrick Anthony, to receive his copy. And let me invite Mr. Melcher Henry to receive on behalf of the Folk Research Center, library. Make sure you put it in the library. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it home. Ms. Ramona Wynn, on behalf of the Cultural Development Foundation. And Mr. Daryl Montrop or someone, yeah, well, Ministry of Culture, sorry, Miss Deputy Permanent Secretary, um, Solange Charles Belizer, and the Standing Committee for Independence, Mr. Montrop. Daryl? Daryl! Daryl is somewhere in cyberspace. He'll get it sometime. No appearance. Okay, thank you. So one more for Celia. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. And let me now invite Ms. Solas Charles Belize, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Tourism, Investments, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information, to deliver a few remarks. I think I need to get there. Stop. Your Excellency, Dame Paulette Louise, Monsignor Patrick Anthony, Mr. Robert Lee, Mr. Kendall Hippolyte, Mrs. Ramona Wayne, distinguished guests, 
Mr. Donald Dixon, other invited guests, special invited guests, a wonderful good afternoon to you. The arts are a very wide range of human practices of creative expressions, storytelling, and cultural participation. They encompass multiple diverse and plural thinking, doing, and being in an extremely broad range of media. It is seen as the vehicle through which human beings cultivate distinct social, cultural, and individual identities while transmitting values, impressions, judgments, ideas, visions, spiritual meanings, patterns of life, and experiences across time and space. Mr. McDonald Dixon, your work over the years have truly embodied what it means to be an artist. Today is indeed an auspicious occasion, and on behalf of the Ministry of Tourism, Investments, Creative Industries, Culture and Information, and on behalf of the Minister, I extend congratulations to you on your relentless dedicated dedication sorry, in pursuing your passion, which has led to yet another masterpiece. A Scream in the Shadows the first crime novel to be published by a St. Lucian writer. Congratulations. This relentless dedication is what we at the ministry aim to nurture as it has the power to transcend lives and be the driver for economic growth and foster sustainable development. The ministry therefore has channeled its efforts in developing a holistic framework for the culture and creative in industry. Essential to achieving this mandate is the review of the national cultural policy, which will be a focused activity in the upcoming financial year. The ministry has conducted several rounds of consultations with stakeholders and is working towards enhancing the data collection efforts to initiate the development of the cultural and creative industries satellite account. The exercise will provide empirical data to assist with policy decisions, create substantive programs for assistance, and value and measure the contribution or contributions of the creative industries to grow domestic product, employment, and job creation. As an accomplished poet, playwright, writer, and also an avid photographer and painter, we look forward to your work being used in the educational sector, in the educational system, and throughout our creatives. Once again, Mr. McDonald Dixon, congratulations on this achievement. Thank you. I wouldn't tell you what he said. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Permanent Secretary. It means, Dixon, if there's a commitment to use your book, in the education sector, you will sell. <laughs> um, I know you've been there with us for a while. We're coming to the end of our ceremony. And let me invite Ms. Ashlyn St. Martin from the Folk Research Center to move the vote of thanks. And thereafter, we'll invite Pablo to do what he does best. Protocol has been established. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. I wish to say a big thank you to Master and Mistress of Ceremonies, Ms. Cantilia Louis and Mr. Ember Charles, for guiding us this lunch to smoothly and expertly. This went a long way towards ensuring that this event was a success. 
I must point to a deep sense of appreciation for Barbara's Cadiz's beautiful, beautiful musical rendition. It said that music is food of love, play on Barbara. We were fed well. We are grateful to Stacy Gidson, George Goddard, David McNullen, Sarah McLennan, Kendall Hippolyte, Jesse Mayers, and Christopher Duncan for reading to us excerpts from A Scream in the Shadows. These were savory tasters. We are now anxious to delve into the main course. Let me express sincere thanks to Mr. Robert Lee for introducing the writer and to the producers of the audiovisual biography of Mr. McDonald Dixon. We wish to thank Polly Patula of Patula Press, the publisher of A Scream in the Shadows, for her remarks. Though she could have been here with us in person, her remarks were well received. We are thankful for the confidence that Popular Press has shown in the work of this talented son of St. Lucia and hope that other St. Lucian writers to follow in Mr. Dixon's footsteps, especially our up and growing writers. Thank you to the co-chair independent standing committee, Mr. Darrell Montra. And also without this funding support, this event would not have been possible, especially at this time. Mr. McDonald Dixon, you have given us this amazing crime story based on a social issue and that we are so, all so familiar with. You have molded this story into a backdrop of cultural legends and provide us with marvelous entertainment. Thank you very much. Thanks as well to the Folk Research Center, the Cultural Development Foundation, and the Independent Standing Committee for collaborating on this important event. Very well done. An event like this requires planning and a bird's eye for details. Thank you for those who were involved in the actual organization of the event, particularly Ms. Drinia Fedrick, who gave up some of her vacation time, and Mr. Tyron Harris to assist in the planning and execution of this event. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for being with us this evening. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashlyn St. Martin. And um, something I must tell you, when we decided, and it was Robert Lee's idea, that we do something about for Dixon on this book, we immediately sent the idea around FRC board members who, I guess in a jiffy, said, let's go ahead. And of course, the next step was where we place it, how we get money for it, but what was most important is the people who read, who jump, jumped at the idea of sharing their talent for McDonald Dixon. And I think I want to give them a resounding applause because that is testament to the respect that we have for MacB. Papa now is supposed to bless the exhibition. So, Papa, let me invite you to officially bless and open the exhibition of Dixon's visual talents. <laughs> well, I don't know what kind of blessing you want, Mark <laughs> uh, Just, um, I would just like to say that um, in Mark we have a connection with, um, with Harry and Derek and Apilo and the person who um, Mark D makes the link to this Leo Spass and Helen <laughs> you see those are the guys who really opened up through Harry the landscape of St. Lucia so Harry showed them what it was like and Leo Spass on his motorcycle <laughs> would go around and Leo would capture scenes of St. Lucia. In fact, Mark D was saying to me that um, he was trying to capture in, in, in photography the morn and some parts of St. Lucia over the years. So for example, every five years, he would take pictures so that you can get an idea of the development of the country through photography. And some of the beautiful prints that um, 
the family still has, and we hope it will become part of the national archives, is the work of, um, of Leo Spass and Helen. So Magdi's photography links in, and that, that makes that connection too. And of course, of course, his, his paintings with um, Apilo, Apilo and Derek's own work. So it gives me great pleasure this afternoon to say a prayer and to bless this country, bless all our St. Lucian spirit, bless our artists, especially our young people who need so much um, positive direction for their creativity so that it can really become something that makes this nation proud. So let's bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Papa Bundi, no ka we mercy on ka glorify you po peino, belti peino. O mete no isia. O banu e sente spi, o ka guide no a direction. We thank you and praise you and bless you and glorify you and we ask you Lord God to continue to use us. Use us as co-creators with you so that the genius of our people may manifest itself in all forms of productivity, music, poetry, drama, novels, paintings. We thank you, Lord God, for that creative spirit of our people. And we pray that the, the, the positive spirit may take over the, the, the heart of our nation, that your spirit may guide this country, guide our political leaders, guide, guide our... our young people, guide our children so that whatever redounds your great and own glory may really manifest in this land and this land of light that is Lucia may truly be a testament in our Caribbean and in the world. We ask you to bless Magdi and bless all of our creative artists. Bless our nation and the 42nd, 43rd anniversary of our independence. We make this prayer to you Father through your son Jesus Union Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. On the pair, a defeat, a descent, a spree, and see swatting.